All right, good evening. Welcome. I'm Jackie Owens, and Trisha Bershenahan and I are co chairs. Bryce and I never is cutie, so that's why I are co chairs of Darien CPAC. And if you're not on our blast yet, please join at DarienCPAC at gmail.com. Our next presentation, Colleges with Support Services panel webinar, is tentatively scheduled for April 25th at 7 p.m. Look for more de details and emails to follow. Please fill out and leave the questionnaire on the table out front after the presentation. We'd really love to know what presentations you would like to have as parents. Also, we're always looking for more parents to join CPAC. So please let us know if you're interested in email us. We'd also love to thank Darien Library for letting us host tonight's event, and also Samantha Cardone, who's always so helpful and gracious and patient with us for organizing these presentations. And um, tonight's presentation is gonna be taped, so um, when Samantha gets it to us. We'll send it out on our e-blast. So that's another reason to be on there if you want it um, If you want to get a copy of it and um, Since it's being taped we ask everyone to refrain from using um, any names any teacher names school names or uh, children's name uh, when asking questions and uh, Kit said that she'll take questions throughout the presentation. So feel free to ask them whenever you have them and also, we have these cards if you don't want to, um, we've got to hand them out so we can hand them. You can send them down to the end and we can collect them if you don't want to raise your hand and ask any questions. Um, you could say you're asking for a friend. And um, then, uh, okay, that's that. So now we'd like to introduce Kit, who's kind enough to come speak for us tonight. Kit Savage sees herself most importantly as a parent first. A professional in education for more than a decade, she is a certified executive functioning coach and special education parent advocate. Kit raised her children in the Darien Public Schools and appreciates all the educators who taught them. Both of her children struggled with literacy and executive functioning skills. Kit began her journey when they were diagnosed early on to become an expert for her own family. As an executive functioning coach, she collaborates with parents and schools as she coaches teens in high school and college one-to-one -to, -one to improve their academic performance, build stamina, and emotional regulation skills. For over a decade, she's been an educational advisor to parents in Connecticut and New York, and since the pandemic, nationwide, ensuring their children receive the supports and services they need to thrive in public school. As they say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Kit found her journey that the insight she gained came long after the hardships and hurdles of educating her children. It is her passion to shorten the long road for parents to ensure their children make progress. Kit teaches teens and adults yoga and meditation as these practices are invaluable for stress reduction and lifelong brain health and wellness. So, yeah, Kit that. Thank you. Um, I see some friendly faces. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, to come out on a night like this, I don't need a mic, so I'll stand over here. Um, I'm first and foremost a parent, and a parent who has gone through the many ups and downs and hurdles. I'm kind of echoing a little. We don't know why. I keep talking. All right, so um, I don't want to talk at you. I want to talk with you. So please, I'm from New York. Interrupt me. Ask me a question. Let's talk. Because I have a sense that if we're all sitting here together, that we might have some, a lot of things in common about our children. And so I'm going to take you through um, two exercises and ask you to play along because there's a reason for them. But first and foremost, let me ask, how, what grade level are your kids? Let's say, how, raise your hands if you have kids in elementary. Okay, good amount. Uh, middle school? High school? Beyond. <laughs> okay, good. So, without further ado, we've got an agenda. I mean, brain science is really multifaceted. So, this is just an, a smattering of what we're going to talk about. Take a look, 
You don't, you, I gave you guys um, handouts to take notes. I really want you to use pens, not phones. There's a reason for that. There's a neurological reason for that. But we're covering a lot, is my point. So if you have questions, please ask. If there's something you want to know that we don't cover or that I went too quickly because I talk fast, just stop me or ask me after. There's uh, information on that that you can reach me. But I start with this. If you're not in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. As parents of neurodiverse children, we hear a lot of opinions. We can find them everywhere, right? And they're not walking your walk. So while we're all on the same road, we each have our own path. And I really do believe that parents know their children best. So that's where I operate from. This is my background. I call this the lived experience. I am not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a uh, professionally trained teacher. I am, I am a businesswoman, number one, and there is a business behind education. And I'm also all these other things <laughs> that added up to 30 years in television. Before children, I worked for Nickelodeon for well over a decade, and I worked in childhood development because all of the programming was based in positive, well, a lot of it was based on an eight-year-old boy, right? So little did I know I would spend not just 10 years with SpongeBob, but another 15 when I raised my boys. So um, in essence, these things added up to um, understanding what it's like to raise children who are capable but struggling with performance. So I've asked you on the page that you have to play along with me with an exercise. And I, there's a reason you came tonight. And I'm gonna ask you to do something vulnerable, use your pen, share it amongst each other, and just take a moment, or a minute and a half, to jot down what brought you here. What is it about this topic that resonates for you? I will share at, at various points. Honestly, probably throughout my kids' ed education, I was worried, are they, are they gonna be able to go to college? That was on my mind. Write what comes to mind. I'm gonna be quiet for a minute while you think through it. This uh, graphic to me says so much about our kids. So it starts at the top, which is about the iceberg we see, the late homework, the homework battles, the missing assignments, and down below you can see this compendium from OCD, EF, autism, dyslexia, fear, anxiety, emotional disorders. And the point of this is that there's so much more going on underneath the surface than what we see on Aspen or Google Classroom. I don't know if how many people, has anyone heard of Dr. Becky Kennedy? Yeah, well, this, this quote I think really sums it up, that our job as parents is to keep children safe emotionally, physically, using boundaries, validation, and empathy. Just hold that in mind as we go through. This is the second exercise. So I start all of my practices. I would imagine as you're writing, there's some, a lot that, of, that comes up. I'm gonna ask you to do something that we need our kids to do and uh, benefits us when, it, when we get to emotional regulation. And I'm gonna ask you to join me in about a minute and a half for a meditation. You do not have to um, do much. You can close your eyes if you'd like. We'll have some music in the background. This is... The point of the med meditation is to recognize that um, in order to be present, we start with the body, always. I don't know if anyone felt any different than when they first arrived. How about when you were writing from that moment, when you were writing down why you were here? Was there a dif difference in feeling of stress maybe when you were, yeah. So I would like you to imagine your children during the school day and the many times that that comes up. So again, parenting advice, but there's this guy, Dan Siegel, who's amazing. He's written really kind, amazing books about the brain and the teenage brain in particular. This is another acronym. This is a field filled with acronyms. But the idea here is that we as adults, as parents, play a huge role in communication with kids and with schools. And that is 
requiring presence. What we just did is an exercise in presence. Finding your feet on the ground, finding yourself with breath. Attunement, when I felt loved, confident, and competent. Resonance and building trust. So I keep the MBA in my title for a lot of reasons. I want to just mention the fact that parenting is big business. There are a lot of resources for parents. It has not surprisingly, you know, it's, it's increased 500% the number of parenting books out there. And, you know, I'm here to say we're all still winging it, right? So your family, your lane, you probably know as much but there are things that we can learn from. And in particular, in the last two, two probably 20 years, there has been a lot of evidence that, that the view of a good family is a direct relationship to your children's behavior, which puts you and your family under the microscope and your child. Before 2000s, that was not, I mean, let's face it, nobody wants your kid having a tantrum in the middle of church, for instance, but this dynamic that your child's behavior is a direct reflection on the quality of your parenting has exploded. It's also created a lot of pressures for kids and for everybody. So I just want to acknowledge that, that that wasn't the case. Think back to your own parents. I don't think they walked around when you were in college saying like, I, my kid's going to wherever. But if you still hear that, it's a sign that we're not living our own authentic lives and raising children that are independent because ultimately, what is our job as a parent? Our job is to become obsolete, to have kids who can live their own lives. So keeping that in mind, this, these two graphics really talk about what is the stress response in kids. There is a lot of stress for kids with executive functioning in their daily school experience. And these graphics are kind of the messages they're getting. They have fight, flight, and freeze, which we'll talk about something called the polyvagal um, theory that we either, you know, these are, these are autonomic responses to stress and kids have them as well. And the mental health crisis in our schools is not getting better. The number one referral for special education services in the nation are mental health issues for our middle schoolers and teens. Previously not diagnosed as special education students is also on the rise. So this is affecting every family in every school around the nation, but there's stuff we can do. So when we look at childhood development, I start with emotional regulation because there's something called available for learning. Has anyone ever heard this phrase? Okay, that's the one hand. Available for learning means you can sit in a classroom and process information or have a conversation or um, function well. The, the system that underlies all of that is your emotional regulation system. Kids are learning emotional regulation and it's a three-part process. It's not, um, it's not about staying calm. In fact, meditation, just to take a little diversion here, is not about staying calm. People say, oh, yeah, I can't meditate, I, don't, yeah, I can't get there, I'm not calm. Um, I spent two years doing this program, and at the end of the day, meditation is about recognizing your own emotions with a little bit of distance. You can be angry, you can be filled with rage, and be meditating. It's the acknowledgement of your own range of emotions, and then your action after pausing. So for kids, think about this. They have to be able to identify their emotions, then figure out what's triggering them, and then they have to be taught, really taught at different ages and stages how to manage those emotions effectively. But for an adult, it's much different. It's about maintaining our attention and being able to complete tasks and organize ourselves, control our info, plus basically live your day, right? Don't get derailed by it. Big difference. So there's two phrases that are used for parenting that relate very closely to um, emotional regulation, attunement and co-regulation. And again, attunement and co-regulation does not mean when you're in the middle of something awful that you don't have feelings. You're not turning yourself into a pretzel to say like, I'm going to be this calm parent while they, you know, take Play-Doh to the, to the rug. You can have them emotions, but there are tools available to you about turning towards this distress and not away. 
working with your child and coming back to an empathetic response. And there's this growth mindset. Growth mindset is really important for kids with EF issues because they feel bad a lot. So the difference is I made a mistake. I am not a mistake. Carol Dweck is the, um, the um, psychologist who researched this. And the idea would be that we are making incremental progress. Sorry. <laughs> you don't have to have, you know, zero to 60, right? Who's looking? Make progress where you're at. And opportunities. This is really important when we think about executive functioning, because executive functioning happens in what's called the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And this is a five-year-old brain, a preteen brain, a teen brain, and a 20-year-old brain. The development of the judgment center, which is in the front of the brain, as you can see, is barely starting in preteens. It's like not even there yet. It's whenever starting, to, again, it's not quite there even in teen brains. And the, the science tells us that they're not fully developed till they're 25. And the science for children who have executive functioning deficits and related disabilities is add three to five years on top of that for your child. So that's just something to keep in mind. If we're expecting organized kids who make good choices, who think ahead and plan, all of that is part of brain development that doesn't actually kick in until towards the end of the teen years through college and beyond. But there's lots we can do. Polyvagal, I mentioned before. I don't know if you guys have ever seen in your kindergarten and first grade classrooms. I mean, you've seen, you know, red light, green light, yellow light. This is a very simple form of distress tolerance is knowing whether you're above the, the line, you're numbed out, you're so anxious you can't function, whether you're within the zone of available for learning or whether you're below it, where you're in depression and you know collapse. This is uh, the main nerve in the body. There's some controversy about it, but understanding what polyvagal system is like when you see a tantruming child and how that's affecting their ability to, to function is helpful because you can actually co-regulate next to them and demonstrate that their tantrum is not going to take you down. You're going to be able to be there and sit with them through their um, tough times. So this is, whether take off the word ADHD, but when it comes to getting tasks done, this is often, I don't know, does anybody find themselves resonating with this? That you have the to-do list and the perception of being non-ADHD that, you know, you're taking one unit at a time, and then the ADHD child is looking at this mountain with no details and feeling like already defeated before I start. Anybody, I see some nodding heads. That's, that's a real feeling. So what, do, what is executive functioning anyway? There is a lot to consider here. It develops throughout our lifetime. We just talked about that it's not until late 20s, but what do we agree on? That it underscores our ability to plan, organize, execute, um, revise, and use judgment. The other piece, which I think is really important, and this comes up in school meetings often, but they don't, they're not below grade level. They're reading on grade level, they're writing on grade level, when they write, or when they're doing it. That's because um, executive functioning deficits is not a um, skills deficit, it's a performance deficit. So in subjects they, that are preferable, at times when they are regulated, their performance has no limit. It could be above average. But when they are impacted, they are, they are unable to perform the tasks even close to what their peers are doing. So has anyone, by show of hands, anyone had this experience where you hear everything looks great, everything's on average, the standardized test looks great, but your child hasn't handed in the last 30 homeworks? Right? What does that mean? So, um, you know, things like completing study guides. Go do it. There you go. There's a math packet. Get it done. You get a lot of blank faces, maybe even in the bottom of the bag, or just ignoring Google Classroom. There's a reason for that, because it's not actually an information deficit. So there's a guy named Russell Barkley um, who is considered the guru of this, and he's a little bit 
of a downer, but, but you know, he's honest at least to say, stop talking at your child like you think they don't understand. They do understand they can't perform. It's just like ADHD is not actually about hyperactivity. It's about underactivity in the frontal part of the brain. So if you take medication, the medication is, if it's effective, activates that. That's where the movement comes in. So there are key phrases to understanding your child's profile, your individual thumbprint, if you will. Working memory is a phrase. Everybody has people, have people heard it before? It's often in your um, psychological testing. But it's important to keep in mind working memory and processing speeds because they really interact. So working memory is the shorthand for the brain. The ability to take in, retain, and immediately recall and manipulate small pieces of information. I can share one of my children in particular. I could not, I could not figure out when it wasn't going to have to be reminded that it's your backpack, your sneakers, and your lunch. Short term, not there. Every single day. Anybody else have something? Share it. What 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 is your? You feel like it's whack-a-mole, right? How can you possibly forget your MacBook? MacBook, right? Okay. Anything else? Call it out. There you go, clear it up. Right, so that's working memory and we use it all the time and we have varying degrees of access to that, but we only have a limited amount of it. Processing speed. So processing speed is how long does it take you to complete the action, task, or project. Now this in a classroom is really tough. You got 19 other kids, the teacher's given the assignment, I'm picturing fourth, fifth, sixth grade, even younger kids, and you have a set amount of time to complete it. Maybe you didn't hear it as a student the first time. You didn't get started right away. And by the time you've gotten started, everybody else is packing up and moving on to the next. Anybody have that experience? You know, time to initiate task. How long does it take your child to initiate? So making sense of what you've seen and responding immediately or close to it is not going to happen if your scores are low and you have slow processing speed, and it's not correlated to intelligence. It's about the time it takes you to take in information and actually sit with it. Sometimes when it comes to the social impact of this, it's like a tip of the tongue. Kids will say, or young adults, or adults will say, I don't like big parties because of that, because I, I can't respond that quickly. I prefer smaller groups. We should allow that neurodiversity down the road allows for that, but in a school setting, it really is an on-demand and certainly Google Classroom and, and the information highway hasn't helped this. We don't give time, variable amounts of time for, for students and kids. So how do we do, what do we do differently? Kids can get repeat exposures to content. I love when parents find out what's coming up, where there's over a summer, there's a book like freshman year. Um, unfortunately, we still read Of Mice and Men. Sorry to, you know, Steinbeck, but I teach it, so it's painful. It's painful for a freshman to go through Of Mice and Men and to break that down. But they could watch a movie, they could read it over the summer or listen to it. We have to think of this as get, elongating the number of opportunities to see content. So it is not the first and last time when it comes in the classroom and then you have to go home and access the reading and perform the task. The other thing about processing and for all our kids is how many of your, you wish your kids still had textbooks? Okay, well, let's tell that to everybody. I do too. And the reason being tactile matters. The reason you're writing with pens or pencils is because the act of writing sticks in a part of the brain differently than typing, which can be a gift if your child has dysgraphia, one of mine does, because his handwriting was never working for him, so he could do it a different way. But for the vast majority of us, when we write something, we retain it better. So in addition to seeing more, about the, more often the classroom content, micro deadlines. So Freshman year, I'm using high school now. Thesis paper. I don't care if you've got EF issues, I don't care if you have two weeks or four weeks, the night before is when you're working on it. And you're working on it till one o'clock in the morning because at points prior to that, you didn't have to show a teacher, a learning center, 
what did you do up to now? And kids are masterful by then at evading the question, have you started the study guide? Uh-huh, maybe not so much. So we have to pause, review, edit, and revise. Not the most favorite task for most children and for kids with executive functioning, there is often parent and child resistance on all of it. But I want to share something. There is hope in this, believe me. But there, there are these boxes, big box places that offer, offer classes or even online classes in executive functioning. How to learn the strategies, right? So how to organize your desk and how to complete that study guide, how to follow a weekly calendar. It promises a whole lot. Um, but they don't work for the vast majority of kids, and there's a reason. You need to be proximal. You need to be near the student. You need to literally, it's a physical thing, sit next to them but not instruct them. Uh, remind them of content, and they need to practice using curriculum. So if you go to an organization class, I know a lot of, I have a lot of parents on my caseload whose kids did that, and they were rock stars. They performed for the class. They showed that they could organize folders in a setting that didn't involve direct schoolwork. And then they went back to school and it was like nothing ever happened. Go ahead. I don't know that there's a set rule. I mean, I think there's something to be said for modeling responsibility. I'm not saying give these kids no responsibility. If, if, if that is how you run your house, and this is where we're going to talk about your family system is not anybody else's, right? right. But if there's consistent failure, and it involves a lot of stress. Here's what I wouldn't do, and I think this is just a good rule of thumb. I would not bring it up for her. I would, I would work in the morning to make sure before we leave the house, you might even have a bulletin board that says, what do I need? Do I have it? And there's something that's moved so that it's literally physically in front of her the night before, the morning of. And if it's gone, it's gone. I, I can't say for sure how to handle that, but I do know if you make it external, and visual, it is a huge plus. So it's not you verbally saying it. It is a you know bulletin board. Sorry, oh, shoot, bulletin board um, that you no longer speak about. Thank you. Because the more you talk, it's like whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> All right. What do I need? And then where is it? Well, the child's eight, so you got some years left. Sorry to say, but. <laughs> But that is, a, that is the push and pull between natural consequences, age appropriate, and your own family. But have, do you have a visual place? What do I need? I think the decision has to come from your family and how it's the dynamic within the family. And you have to pick and choose the battles. Absolutely. You have to pick and choose. But um, I, it, is, it is what I think is also true is we, and I use myself as we have parenting that is 30 to 40 percent more intense than those who do not have EF children who have their own struggles. But this is this is a real frustration for family systems. Does any, everybody feel that way? Right. I don't know one that it's not. I don't know one that it's not. But you had a question, too. I'm sorry I don't have a direct answer, but I'm, it is this is like pick your battles. Right. I think it is. It's a different path. And I th think that's why I'm standing in front of you because I was in those shoes as well. So I can tell you when my son would take a bus to Windward to learn to read for five years at age nine, he would routinely forget his lunch. But when it comes to things like the body, right? Food, they need the food. They, I would drop that lunch off any day because you can't learn with, you can't be available for learning. A violin, you can be available for learning. It's unfortunate. Maybe Violin might become an area that this, your child doesn't pursue, but that, that does have different consequences. So yes, you're on a different path. I'm acknowledging that. And I'm saying it is not easy because it is emotional at all times. How many, how many of us are standing with the car door open waiting for our kid? <laughs> Screaming for our kid, right? So. So I'm, I'm not trying to make this into something easy that I'm trying to acknowledge that it is, it is complex and there are resources and you have to pick your battles and your priorities and the habits you want to embody for your child with your child over the long haul. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and certain uh, personality types within 
executive functioning find um, in some ways it's like raising a Supreme Court justice that they'll find a way that one time you let it happen and let it slide. So why does that matter now? So again, so <laughs> I've been there. Um, what is interesting about executive functioning is you often see people talking about organizing things, right? Organizing your stuff, getting your getting in a car. But what we don't talk about is that before you can get to organizing, you actually have to have the perception that something's wrong. And that is a primary executive function that does not necessarily come online in any way, shape, or form in order. So your working memory may be, their working memory may be impacted. Their cognitive flexibility. Anybody got that one? Yeah, right, you know. That, that affects it too, my perception of what you're asking me to do when you've changed something that I didn't anticipate. Um, the attention issues, distractibility if you have ADHD, and then the emotional regulation of I can't deal with this and I'm gonna become dysregulated in this. So if you don't have these secured in place, which take years, then the next advanced ones, which is the one we all focus on, which is your time management, your planning, your metacognition, which is how do you think about, like, why did you do that? Like, I don't know. I've seen a lot of blank faces, right? I don't know. I just did. Um, their own self-awareness, their own problem-solving ability. And I think that is where the natural consequences come in. If you're willing to give up that, you know, maybe this is not going to be a violinist because you haven't put in the time for it. I think that's a reasonable expectation. And organization skills. They don't come easy. They just don't. And I, if you ever, um, most of the time when I'm working with families directly who have that clean space, what do they always tell you? Make sure it's in the same space where the kid does their homework and it's quiet and they don't study late and it's organized. Who's doing all that? Mom and dad are doing all that. So it's a false sense of organization. And quite frankly, I tutor one kid in a diner that's really busy because the activity helps his brain keep going. We all learn a little bit differently. So how do you diagnose it? Has, um, I don't know who or may or may not have gone through the process, but the gold standard is a neuropsychologist. Is it called a neuropsych evaluation? And there are some, I mean, I emphasize some clinical psychologists. There's many that will say they can, but we want to know that they have extra training in EF remediation. Because if you're going to go the route of a neuropsych, there are two pieces to any neuropsych that is essential. It's not just the testing, which is really discrete testing. It is the analysis and the profile and the recommendations for school, home, and family. Without those pieces, I don't want to see the testing alone because I need to know what does that mean for this student in their school environment? What, what do they need accommodations for? But what needs to be a service individualized to them? And then there are related evaluations, but this chart I think is really helpful to see that the, there is so much overlap. That's generalized anxiety disorder down there, autism spectrum, ADHD, and sensory processing. It's all interwoven. They didn't have LD on this one, but learning disabilities as well. But an OT eval, for instance, can identify sensory processing. Sensory processing affects what? Emotional regulation. Speech and language has a plethora of impact on this. Communication, inferencing. Do I know what you mean? Do I understand what you're saying to me quick enough? Processing speed again. And then in literacy, comprehension, decoding, and writing all impact um, executive functioning and the development of it. More than one is the norm. Comorbidity is the technical phrase. Um, there's a very high likelihood of comorbidity. EF, I don't think I've ever seen in, like, in and of itself, existing with no other comorbid, comorbid disability. So 100% of students that are diagnosed with ADHD have executive functioning deficit. It is the very definition of ADHD. Um, about 80% of students who have dyslexia, learning disabilities, autism spectrum, and nonverbal learning disabilities also have EF deficits. Anxiety and depression disorders can also have it as well. 
We often see it, if the child has made it to a certain point, we often see it in the writing process because that is an, a sequential organization that takes multiple steps. Um, it's important to know there's no one test for this, which is why I went back to neuropsychologists, right? Neuropsychologists take a battery of tests. There's rating scales. I'm not going to get into all of this because I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I think it's suffice it to say that it takes multiple measures for them to be able to make the profile for your child. So yes, ADHD, yeah, it is. So that's inattentive type. So this one really was an eye-opener for me in my training to be a coach. When we think about time, everything with organizing and planning and executing involves time. If you're a child, you think in the present. If you're in early elementary, you can think about 12 hours ahead. Middle schoolers and tweens, we're doing one to two days. High schoolers, three to seven days, right? Think about midterm planning. And college kids think about one to three weeks ahead. That's not a long time. And before Google Classroom and before the pandemic, the expectations on what students could do independently were, were a lot lower. But since pushing all content into a device, we now expect students to independently access that content, manipulate it, and produce work at younger and younger ages. Has anyone ever heard of time blindness? Okay, good, nobody, I like this. All right, so um, you can actually be time blind. You can be diagnosed with this, meaning, I don't know, does anyone have a relative that's always late? Like consistently, almost predictably, three hours late? You, it could be time blindness. Like they just don't have an internal clock. But it's pretty fair to say that this affects EF about 30, this is where I call this 30% more intense parenting. We're up against this kind of blindness in terms of being able to plan ahead, organize, and respond. So what do we do about all this, right? This is a lot of information. We do know one thing, that the body regulates, yeah, go ahead. Exactly, most of the time. Again, if it's preferential and it's lacrosse and I really like lacrosse, I might remember one of my, you know, one pad and two sticks and, call, and be freaking out anyway. But, <laughs> but preference matters, emotional regulation matters towards the accessing and performance of their skills. So yeah, 30, you know, and, and that's average. Obviously, we have some kids who are particular, particularly strong at this. But I can't emphasize enough about sensory processing and the body. Keeping that regulated gives you options for, your, for yourself and your children because the first step for any sequence that any of us ever do involves the body. How many people are getting up from their desks? And how about during the pandemic? There was a lot of research on the sedentary nature of Zoom. And there were employers that were having to insist that we take 20 minute breaks, we walk around. There's a reason we organize our thinking based on our body first. So the body in the room, are you in the room? Frequent breaks are really important, but to, have you ever noticed like after elementary school, the breaks go away, right? Kids still need them. And if you um, have those needs identified by testing, those needs don't go away after elementary school. You may need those breaks. You may need a card on the middle school desk so you can go get, a glass, get some water, get a break before you do a hard subject. And then there's something called cognitive load. Now this is something we can do something about. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, so, well, one or two heads. Cognitive load is about how we teach and model for our kids. So again, external structures for as long as possible will help executive functioning. And that's not just kids who are diagnosed, that's all of us. Um, Sometimes we don't open our apps, right? But if you have a pad by the door, you may see it. There's two kinds of loads, intrinsic and extrinsic. I, I like to use a study guide because everybody here has heard about or had to force their kid through a study guide. I am not a big fan for executive functioning kids in filling out the study guide because what is intrinsic is we want to have a student learn the content. 
but if it takes them so long to get to the content and fill out every single definition and not be learning, but just executing, by the time we get to the test, are you testing them on their ability to do the study guide or the content within it? So I like skeleton notes where it's half filled out. I like micro deadlines where they're checking on it. But if that doesn't happen, I am much happier to work with a student on a filled out study guide so we actually know what's happening in the test. And ex so it's really about what do we expect of the student? And study guides are a good example of that. So intrinsic is what is the information they need to know? What do we have to know? The germane is linking that with current information. So that's where a study guide, again, I know many kids who will sit and do those definitions, they don't have any recollection of what they're doing. They're literally cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting. They don't even type them anymore. They just go to the internet, look it up, and paste. But unnecessary or distracting information, anything we can take off their plate, let's do it. So if you have a writing process and it's early enough in the learning process, I don't mind a scribe where someone takes down what you want to write. If it's that hard for you to write it out or type it out, let's get a first draft where it's all your thoughts. And then edit it. And then go back. So it's about relieving things that we would expect from, from students who don't have EF issues so that they can get their learning in and out in an easier fashion. Also, we can do that with multimodal. So some, some kids can do a video, not have to, type, not have to do a written, um, written expression. Unfortunately, for education, what do we rely on? Written expression, right? It's probably 85% of learning. What if you're not a writer? Doesn't mean you don't have an ability to do academics. It means that you have to have a different method of being assessed. So we're moving on to what I call the uh, elementary toolkit. Again, if it, if at this age, it's about modeling. It's about repetition from the classroom teacher, reviewing the purpose of your task. This is in the school day. Restating your assignment and multimodal modal learning. So it's not enough to have a 504 if your child is chronically not doing well. You have to advocate for specialized instruction in the writing process. If it involves reading and you have comorbid issues with that as well. But often families struggle with this. Where does an accommodation end and a service begin? Accommodations are not services. They're access to. But as many parents say, if my kid could access it with no help, they wouldn't have an executive functioning deficit. So... Um, for families, you need time for play. Activity is probably the best thing that they can get in between. Please try not to set an exact time for when you do homework. I have a student who studies late at night, drives his parents through the roof. And quite honestly, he said to me, I do that because I think I, I, I can keep it in my head for the morning. It's a fear-based thing. So I don't want to stop him. Of course, we don't want him up till 1 o'clock. But I don't want to stop him from that. If that makes him feel more confident in a test situation, then let that happen. First thing I do whenever I'm tutoring a kid is check the body system. Have you exercises? Have you, do you need something to eat? How do you feel? Often stuff that they're not going to talk about have, has happened all throughout their days. Micro bumps that maybe went well, maybe did not. Um, and fatigue. Boredom is the gift. Let them be off their devices as much as possible. And I say that with heart because we're not off our devices, are we? So it's a little hard when we don't model the same. I know that families that set a basket in the kitchen and everyone puts the phone in the basket, parents included, it does tend to help. It helps with falling asleep. It's a hard thing, though. I get it. But it's, it's a strategy that has worked for families. Um, Feeling, all feelings are okay, but behavior is where our boundaries are, right? So we want to hear our children's, all of their emotions, their joys, their excitement, as well as their frustrations and fears. But we model boundaries by allowing that within, within the realms that work for our family. And again, everything for EF and ADHD is external. So many more frequent small rewards, and I don't mean trinkets, I mean authentic support. 
the kid who says like, oh, you know, who, who feels that every little thing you're like, way to go, right? They know that's not really authentic, but try to keep a balance of positive, much higher five times supposedly is the, is the rule to the negativity if you can. It helps. But a lot of elementary has to come from the school day. So if your child is not bringing home what they need from school, I would very much advocate that you work with the school-based team to have someone checking the pack up. And if you can prove that the child doesn't need it, great, move on from that. But I see a lot of parents having kids come home, things are a mess, and they don't have what they're needing the next day, and then the parents are doing all that work. I, you really need the school situation to take control over that because you're not there. This is not the kind of learning that you can take on. The middle school years are really variable. It's all emotion. <laughs> One hot mess, three years of hot mess. The bodies are changing. You've got, you've got, you know, girls fully developing, guys are, you know, a couple of them look like they're 20. Um, but it's also the fastest, the beginning of the fastest development all the way through half of the teen years of our brains in our entire lifetime. So that's part of why it's exhausting. And you have puberty in the middle of that. Expectations, and then there's this thing called individuation in independence. So the homework wars start in earnest in the middle years, where parents want to help and kids say, leave me alone, or worse, right? Of those of you with middle schoolers, do you guys experience this, the homework wars? Yep. Um, Kids still need sensory input to regulate their, their bodies. Get them out, get them involved in anything you can. Um, where you can, this is the age where they do have choice and independence. Picking where they study, picking how, what order they study. When do you take a break? You can have a hard stop of what you absolutely need to do, but if you can give choice, better. Um, repetition, again. This is, this is a cohort that needs a lot of repetition before moving on and natural consequences. So that is also part of learning. We can't take that away or we create something called learned helplessness, right? If I wait long enough, somebody will do something for me and I don't have to do it for myself. That's just human nature. Any questions? And then high school. Oh, the high school years. <laughs> this acronym is my favorite. Why am I talking? Wait, wait, or at least drive. Somehow in the car where they're not looking at you, you can have much more productive conversations. Listening more than talking, because they're not, they're not able to do that. Their job is to become independent from you. That's their job. So the battle is there. Checking in, um, how, if you're instructing, this is how we instruct. We have the student, tell me what, tell me what you need to do. Uh, Often if it's a classroom situation where they, they've done the noodle tools, has anyone been through noodle tools? Noodle tools is like next level annotations and citations. I, I feel like if you can do noodle tools as a student, you should be getting an A. But they have to take those citations and then put them into the thesis that they're working on. So um, again, if there's a shift, a kid with an EF challenge doesn't naturally pick up what that means. What do I have to do next? So you have to break it down. When it comes to um, DBQ essays in, in middle school, they don't happen in middle school, but in high school, they will have um, like Western Civ and um, English, they, they will have in-class essays. And that's where an alternate setting can be incredibly helpful because hearing the um, tapping of the keys around you while you're struggling to organize your essay, because you could bring in one index card with everything you want to bring in to remember, that's a hell, heck of a lot of pressure. Um, and the next list is just, these are things that are in IEPs as I work on them, is pre-teaching, repeat exposure, continuing vocabulary building, especially if you have a language-based learner. We stop teaching vocabulary in middle schools but multisyllabic words and content vocabulary doesn't end. If we expect kids to keep developing, these are kids that really benefit from that, getting explicit definitions and learning from that. And then monitoring 
how they're doing with their teacher incrementally. And then the last piece is coaching from teachers, therapists, and tutors to help model self-regulation and self-advocacy skills. The job in high school is to become your own self-advocate, to be able to know what you need, and to be able to get it. Perfectly, no. But if you aren't aware, if you're not self-advocating, you're not going to be able to do that in college where you do not have someone who's going to follow you and find out what you need. Questions, thoughts? Anybody got high schoolers getting ready for college? Not yet? Two? Okay. So these are the kinds of supports that aren't available in colleges. So it's important we get them in the early high school years and then pull them away so we can do more and more stamina building. So this is my area. I'm, as an executive functioning tutor, this is how my approach. I only tutor individually and I only tutor in person. I will tutor online a bit, but the reason I do that is because uh, you have to see the eyes of the kids, right? Are they even with you? And uh, we always start with movement. Is your body in the room? We check on, I check on the basics. We use 20 minutes as a timer, the Pomodoro method. They, they have all this great music on YouTube, the study tunes that they play in the background. They, we do some of that too. And what, what I'm doing is I'm not reteaching, I'm not a teacher, I'm reteaching the content they've already learned and giving them the space to tell me what they want to do in a space where they're positively motivated and it's not the parent. Because if your job is individuation as a student, and I have, I don't know whether it's um, the universe's sense of humor, but how many of you are actually pretty organized yourselves, right? There's a little bit of a sense of humor to have a child that's not. I'm a writer and I had two children who struggled tremendously with the writing process. I didn't do it with them. I had a tutor for them because I knew I could help them. But the job of a teen is to break away from their parents. So it's actually not personal for you, the fact that you can't do this with them. Scaffolding, molding, coaching, recovery from setbacks. Do you know what I talk about most with teenagers when they first get into my sessions? Anybody have a, what? In the very beginning, it's, it's social. Yeah. What happened? Who did what, where, when? They can't learn when, you know, also the Snapchat, I mean, we have to turn that off. A lot of what we talk about is how do we regulate that when Snapchat is going all day long? How do you turn that off? Maybe I turn it off because when I go out with my girlfriends or boy, or my guys, guys less so, definitely girls, um, I, I do things I don't really like to do. I'm doing, I'm doing too much. I'm contacting that person I shouldn't contact that much. That's all emotional self-regulation. We work on building some tolerance, some stamina for putting that stuff aside and being with our friends. So we have to keep a bit of a sense of humor. We have parallel learning and we get the stuff done. Parents are often shocked when they have a tutor, how much work gets done. And then the next question I always get is, but they don't do it when you're not here. I can't fix that. But by showing them and modeling that they can do this work, they start to, it does start to bleed out. It does get them to the place where they don't feel bad about themselves every day. If you had, we started this, this session with a moment where you felt confident, a moment where you felt competent, and a moment where you felt loved. If you can imagine the hurdles we've just talked about, which doesn't in any way limit your child in terms of their intellect, their personality, their desires and future. But if you kept running into these kinds of hurdles, how many times in the day do you feel that? Or how many times in the day do you feel like it's just too hard, I just don't feel like even I'm zoning out? So looking at your papers and what you wrote, I'm gonna ask you a question for yourselves. Are the things that you wrote down future casting? Is it far in the future? I see some nods. And some of us, uh, I am a big proponent of um, therapists, but I want us to talk about this true fact here, which I believe that Kennedy be to write, is that when we have a child that goes to CBT or therapy, it's not the child that's in therapy, it's the parents, it's us. It's how do we manage, like you said, 
the fact that this is like 30% industrial strength for getting everything you needed to do. And that that is repetitive and the whack-a-mole builds up and your fuse gets shorter and shorter, right? So this is our work with a therapist and, and your child. Having done it myself, I cannot endorse it more. That is really helpful and it's, it's really important. So Dr. Becky Kennedy's book, Good Inside, The Guide to Becoming the Parent You Want to Be. No one goes into parenting expecting a child with a disability. Nobody goes into parenting actually, honestly, probably knowing a whole lot about what we want to do. Maybe we want to do the opposite of our parents. We all have sort of like generic ideas. There's lots of really good information out there. I would say that I have a, a few here. But the, just to conclude, I just wanted to talk about the therapeutic supports. I can say from my practice, after the pandemic, I can't work with families who don't have a child also in therapy, in family therapy with them. Because the issues are too intense between kids and their parents and getting things done and the fears that might be on your pages. And therapists that are appropriate for teens can really guide families very, very well through that. So a couple of facts that are optimistic. So probably it, it might be five, I mean, where's Courtney? She would know. Um, they started to be able to identify dyslexia on an MRI, which is really important because there's been many decades where it was um, doubted to be real. They've just recently um, also done that for ADHD where they actually can show that the, the frontal lobe is actually thinner. So this is huge progress towards getting an acceptance of ADHD in our communities, not just a, this is a pain in the neck kind of thing that's an optional, do pull your bootstraps up, right? I don't know who, lots of parents have been told that when they might have been diagnosed a long time ago. Um, and it's considered by psychiatry to be one of the most treatable conditions in mental health. So I'm not a pill popper, believe me, but I am gonna say that there's no doubt that if the medication is effective for your child, that it can be life-changing during the years they're in school because let's do the math together. If your frontal lobe isn't mature until after you're in your 20s, that's your entire school career. And I don't know about you, but how many of us want our kids to go to college independently? Right? I think all of us do. If they need something and it works and it's clinically what works for your family, it can be a life changer experience. Um, and CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, is with your child. It's not for your child. You've got to be a part of it. Family systems work. And there's something, uh, has anyone ever heard of DBT? Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And this is my personal watch out. I'm just gonna say that, you know, even Yale offers this, so I'm, you know, going against Yale and I don't care. Um, dialectical Behavioral Therapy requires a level of understanding that under um, mid-teens, kids don't have yet. Dialectical is being able to hold two things in mind. So you start with CBT. Am I aware of what I'm doing? Before you can get to something called DBT, and there is there are excellent programs for students who need it um, in DBT around Fairfield County, uh, but they really are targeting teens, not preteens. And then um, don't forget, if this is necessary, exposure therapy still exists for kids who have OCD and school avoidance or school re refusal, because those can be comorbid and things that come up. But beware the things that are trendy. Things like brain balance, chiropractic, and cognitive, cognitive games to improve working memory. There's no science behind it. And my, my feeling is your child has a big enough job as it is. Their job is to go to school every day. And that's a lot of work. So let's work on making the environment in the school work for them, understand their conditions, challenge them where we can, and support them. Thank you. What's exposure therapy? Exposure therapy is, um, so there, since, uh, and I'm, again, this is since the pandemic, there were a lot of teens that developed school avoidance. So they might not be willing to walk in, but once they're in the school, they can get there. So exposure is whatever you're most, of, have a fear response to, you can work with a coach and they will, will expose you to that. 
So anxiety disorders very much um, impact executive functioning. So that's a generic way of understanding, and, and even school refusal. Let me tell you some good news. It does eventually come online. You do eventually challenge your child. I would say every year of high school, both of my children had IEPs. We worked diligently to pull back supports to see what the performance was. And the biggest message, maybe the last message I have is the biggest one, is we actually have to allow to fail up. We have to let it happen. Do you know how many times I have this conversation with both you know, advocacy clients, but especially Ia? Where do I let it fall? You need to try that. You, and you might even work with school on saying like, I am not actually in fifth grade anymore, so I'm not actually gonna get all the work done and then hand it in with my child in the morning. I'm gonna actually let that not happen. Right, and I think that's a huge piece of this. A huge piece of this, but I'm not unaware that we're all in the rat race together, right? So, and I, uh, and this is just something that I will share is I've been tu I've tutored before and after the pandemic. Uh, the fact is that the U.S. government has tracked, the, unfortunately, it was a wash. Nobody learned much during the pandemic, despite all the efforts. And if you have a kid with neurodiversity, even less was achieved. So I wish we would readjust our expectations. I'd much rather have a kid who exits the middle school not writing two pages, but writing three good paragraphs. I'd much rather that. But education moves slow and there's still, you know, it's like reset and start again as if the pandemic didn't happen. But we do have choices, like you said, and even in high school as well. And I know that's really hard. And I don't, I, even families with who do have those schools, the Colgates, the St. Lawrence's, all of those places that they want their kids to go. If they have a kid with neurodiversity, I've yet to meet a family who isn't acknowledging like, it's okay, I don't want them to have to feel that pressure. But we do have to build in throughout their education times where, where they are actually failing up, where they are learning, and where, um, where parents and, and their kids are talking about the repair. Arguably, none of us grew up with repair. Parents blew up, you just moved on, but, right? But repair means you talk about it and you, and you do your best to make a better outcome the next time. <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody else? Yes, um, I've heard students say they actually love it. Yes, um, and it depends on the teacher though. That's a long time in a classroom. So there are teachers who have structured that very well. I don't know explicitly how each teacher approaches it, but there is something to be said for a little bit of a break and a breath between classes because kids have <coughs> varying different skill sets and levels of skills, right? So if I'm doing well in my language and my math, those are my good days. On the days that I have to do it, go through English language and Western Civ, I can sort of take a deep breath and get through that. Um, but there is evidence at the high school level that the teachers and the students both like it. So I don't think they would continue it without it. No. Absolutely. So the question is about how to make it about positive um, rewards as opposed to consequences, right? Threatening consequences. Um, I don't exactly have an answer. I used to think it was a moving target because whenever I would set up like the whole system, by the time it was set up, my kids' interest level changed. So those consequences or those, those pluses would move. Unfortunately for all of us, the screen time is the most powerful thing. It's a dopamine hit every time we're all on it. So that can actually be both a benefit and also create incredible disruption if that's not happening. So this is where I do defer to therapists, child therapists to find out, and your educators, to find out what is motivating for your child and to keep that in mind, because when you're constantly in that up the ante, it's really tough to actually attune and actually resolve things. So I hear what you're saying. I don't have a, a specific answer because it is tough. It is, and um, it is. It does get better when they get a little bit older, just a little. Well, have you done? Have you had comprehensive testing? Do you even know what's going on? Okay, so was, was there a learning issue? No. Okay, so um, that rules, ruling in and ruling out. 
Okay. Well, right there. That is quite the disability. I didn't mention 2E. 2E is exceptional and um, with uh, an impact from a disability, which is, which is a special need. It's very difficult. So um, what is the skill you think your child needs? I'm not a marital counselor in any way. I, I, don't, I don't actually have great answers for these things. I think you have to navigate it both with teachers, with supports, and with this. Now, when you do it, does he actually get the work done? Thank you. So that's where your reality is. But has anyone, do you know what body doubling is? A, a lot of what I'm doing in the first 10 minutes of every session is body. It is the physical presence of having someone next to them to do their work that actually can get them started. And when I do, while I don't teach anything to do with math, I have math phobia. Um, I do coach kids who have to get their algebra done. So what I, I, I just have a technique where I say, look, I have to look through your Google Classroom. Well, oh, you, you've got that algebra homework that your mother told me you had to get done. Um, why don't you just do three minutes of it, four minutes of it? They're doing it for 15 and we're going through all this. So body doubling matters. This is a, 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 that's where proximity does matter. So if it's effective and it's positive and it's getting it done, and how old is 16. That's getting older though. So that's where getting a J-O-B will be a really good thing. Because what are we doing this for? We're doing this ultimately so our kids can actually get paid and not be on our couch. <laughs> get a job. Trust me, get the job. Okay, that's great. So it, this is going to be a navigation, but he's also at an age where you can also show some natural consequences because grades that are at not at certain levels, your GPA is not at a certain level, your options go down. And that is just part of life. So, right. So, so the question is about the, the processing speed and the writing process and, and um, kind of both being anxious and not terribly sure of what to do. The first thing for any student anywhere is can they tell you what they're supposed to be doing? Because if they can't, it's a pretty good shot that they're not going to finish it. But this happens a lot to parents that um, grades are subjective and they may be getting a grade for submission, not content. And then as you read it, um, there you can see, well, there were three parts, even in fifth grade, where you needed to answer this, this, and this. And you did the first half of the second and skipped the third. And then you're the one doing that with your child. So this is where I will say partner with your teacher. If you have three examples of that, sit down with the teacher and say, okay, we're in fifth grade. We're about to go to sixth. We're in eighth grade, about to go to ninth. And I'm seeing my child is not actually finishing tasks fully. And break that down and figure out why is that happening. Some of it is speed to finish, right? So they're, they're kind of on the treadmill. Just get it done. Just get it done. And some of it could be um, processing speed to slow it down. But I would encourage you to partner with your teachers so you're not the bad guy because the other piece that can happen is if they get the good grade, then what are you supposed to do with that? You know it didn't make any sense, but they got it done. But that is a huge indicator for future focus, right? Completing tasks accurately, and I put that in IEPs all the time. It's not enough to complete it, but did I answer it appropriately? Did I answer all parts of it? Is a really big part of that. So that's a good catch, but try not to become, you know, the literacy police. I was one. I don't know that answer because I'm not um, a cognitive scientist. I can say just anecdotally that our screen times are creating shorter and shorter attention spans. We all get dopamine hits from it. So if you're already at ADHD, brain, then that actually feels really good, but it's not exactly content because it's all about the speed. Um, Google Classroom, I think is a nightmare. Honestly, I think textbooks have to come back because you have to open up and read one thing, close it, open up another document, answer it, cut and paste, put it in a third document. You are because it's like we're creating little, you know, Google, Google Classroom experts. It's not the same as learning. So I think the more that we could swing back towards experiential learning, the better, the less on the screens, which I realize is very difficult, the better. But I do even have teachers in middle school saying they're getting kids that now go to high school that have never created a timeline because Google Classroom is doing it for them.
reminding them for them. And of course, I have a lot of kids who do that. Even with that, it doesn't matter. The missed category is like a really long list. And I keep a sense of humor about it, but that is a, that is a skill set we used to have to do. So there's something to be said for accommodations. It's sort of like all the apps, right? There's an organizing app for that. But if you don't use it, what's the point? Start with a piece of paper. So external supports help and, um, and textbooks, being able to tactile, to read the book, not the Kindle. Um, getting off of screens is just better for all of our mental health. I, I can't even tell you because you're going to cry. It's, it's like so low that nobody I know is realistically living that way. But then think about school. How much time are they getting on the school? And then part of the behavioral issues for a lot of kids that I think is unfair for them is, oh, we told you to close the Chromebook. We told you to close. You know, I mean, it's the management of tech in their day. I wish, I wish every school had cubbies with locks and you put all your cell phones in them and they were gone and your watches and all your devices. There you go. I mean, we can't turn back time. So the, the issue is, the issue is trying to work with that. But you know, two hours, they're doing that in school now. So um, I don't have a great, great answer. I, I want you to just keep your kids involved in as many things that are experiential as you possibly can. Go to off-Broadway shows, go to into the city, take adventures. Things that we did during, honestly, a lot of us did it during COVID. Who got out more? Who did more, you know, outdoorsy types of stuff? I think we're all um, still recovering from that time and getting ourselves off screens in any way, shape, or form that we can, can do nothing but help us all. There's an, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard, I'm pretty sure you have. Judd Apatow is a famous brides, bridesmaids, you know, 40-year-old version. He is like one of the best writers out there and he he was left home alone a lot and he wrote these crazy scripts and all this stuff went to comedy clubs and did all this and he's like I did all that because I like thought this is what I wanted to do nobody told me no there was nothing else better to do got a super 8 camera and look at him now boredom's a good thing it breeds creativity thank you all for coming out it was great to see you hope this helped